reversing hegemon. We'll try to explain what this is about. Uh, this is the introduction today. But we're going to have some fascinating material for you on the 22nd of September. And there is Mount Hermon. It really exists. It's not a mere myth. In the Bashan range, both Hermon and Bashan are mentioned in the scriptures a number of times. Today it's called the Golan Heights. And what country is it in? Israel. Syria. 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 Captured by Israel. A subtitle Enoch, the Watcher and the Forgotten Mission of Jesus Christ. Have you forgotten his mission? No. But there were parts of his mission that over the centuries Christians have forgotten because we stopped talking about it. Um, we'll have to come back around to that. What, what was Jesus doing regarding those mysterious spirit creatures that we meet in the Old Testament and the New? What's this? What's going on in this picture? Um, They're looking for wives. I, I asked the uh, AI, would you please draw me a picture of the watchers coming down out of the sky looking for human wives? Uh, we have five objectives for this course. I do. Learning objectives for you. You may agree with them if you wish. Understand Genesis 6, 1 to 4, and the sin of the watchers in their original context. The ancient Mesopotamian story of the Al-Kalu, as preserved in the Book of Enoch, setting the stage for Jesus Christ to reverse the effects of their evil deeds. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. That's the author's own. But we have some mysterious uh, creatures in here, the watchers. What are they watching and who are they? The Al-Kalu? Ever heard of them? If you watch History Channel much, you hear a lot about uh, the Al-Kalu, a lot of fake stuff <laughs> about Mesopotamia. What is Mesopotamia, by the way? Otherwise known as the Fertile Crescent. Persian arc from the Gulf of Persia, the Persian Gulf, across through the fertile Tigris-Euphrates valleys and down into parts of southern Eurasia. Exactly. <clears throat> so Meso means between. between. Potamia means rivers. So between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, but beyond, as Jeff just described. All right, and, and Enoch. Who? Enoch. All right, what's going on here? Looks like Jesus is talking to the devil. <laughs> it could be the devil or some other demon, and Jesus is telling him, go away. By the way, why don't you read about demons in the Old Testament? They only show up in the Gospels. That's not quite true. They are mentioned several times in the Old Testament, but not in evangelical language. They're mentioned in Hebrew and Biblical language, so we often don't recognize them. So, learning objective number two. Someone else, read this aloud. Describe how the theme of a person, the watcher's transgression, colors the gospel accounts of Jesus' birth, his genealogy, his temptation, his ministry, his transfiguration, his death, his resurrection, and his reign. Yeah, in other words, pretty much the whole story. <laughs> and so, yeah, there was a great historical transgression that took place other than the one by human beings. The colors in a lot of the Gospels there. All right, now, the watchers. Interestingly, the world is catching on to this biblical theme of the watchers. And so there's a new movie being prepared titled The Watchers. You can watch for it coming out. I probably won't look at it. But it does introduce learning objective number three. Someone else read it aloud. Explain how the epistles of Peter and Paul allude to the sin of the watchers and present Jesus overturning the disastrous effects of their sin against humanity. Exactly, yeah. Now, even Paul himself talks about what he calls in Greek the cosmocrators, the cosmocrats, the authorities and the rulers in the air who are wicked. And who were they? Well, we'll find out. And so he says, living as a Christian, 
part of our privilege and duty is to overturn, overturn those defects. What's going on here? Who do you think this might be? The Antichrist. The Antichrist. Yeah. Notice the world loves him. He is going to be quite popular across the nations. <clears throat> and therefore, earning objective number four. Demonstrate how the descriptions of the Antichrist, how the end times, day of the Lord, and how the final judgment connect to Genesis 6 and to the Ephilim. Right. So what is the connection? Day of the Lord, that's a technical biblical term for the end of time when God judges the nations. And, uh, and the final judgment of all living beings, what does that have to do with the Nephilim? And then one that I have added, what's going on here? If you ever have a chance to live in the third world and get involved in a Christian church, you find out that the main activity is prayer. Christians will pray sometimes by the hour. It's just astounding. All right, so lastly. Pray more effectively to deliver persons and people groups from the tyrannical spirits who rule over nations, confidently standing against the global antichrist and his deceitful spirits. Uh, this is our objective. I think perhaps the most important one in this study is when we pray, how can we exercise our authority in Christ over the spirits that hold the world in bondage? Just uh, last month, a missionary in Thailand contacted me over internet and said, we've got a problem. We've set an objective for our team to go share the gospel in every village of every sub-district of our part of Thailand. And we've got teams going out now, but typically, when they arrive in a village, they try to find people, greet them, try to talk to them, uh, they want to share the gospel, but inevitably, the folk just say, well, I'm not interested, or I have to leave, or I've got something else to do, and so they, they turtle off. And so I just asked, well, how do you pray before you enter the village? What do you ask God to do? Well, they do pray, of course. They, they ask for contacts. And then I reminded them of a verse that, from the Gospel. Jesus said, when you want to break the power of Satan uh, over any community, what should you do? Right. Remember the promise he gave? How can you exploit a strong man? Unless you first do what? Tie him up. You tie him up. You bind him. Then you can deliver his captives. And you can take the goods out of his house that he has stolen from others. So at their request, I drew up a list of 10 such verses from the Bible. So he said, all right, I'm going to share this with the team members. When he contacted me the next week, he said, this is interesting. We now spend some time binding the strong man and breaking the power of the local spirits. And there are plenty of them in a Thai village. And they said, in just the last two weeks, we've seen several people uh, pray to receive Christ, repent of their sins, we've baptized a few, and now we're teaching them how to obey Jesus. Oh, wow. Metatron, by introducing the books of Enoch, <clears throat> There are three of them that we know of. There are other books that have Enoch in their title, but there is what we'll call First Enoch, like in First Kings and Second Kings, probably composed in the third century before Christ in Aramaic language, which is similar to Hebrew. But it, it was then translated into Greek because at that time, most Jews did not speak Hebrew. It was also translated into the ancient Ethiopian language. I want to come back to that in a moment. There's another book titled Second Enoch, written in the first century during the time of Jesus. It was written in Greek by Jews, but it's only been preserved in Slavonic language. That's still the official language of the Russian Orthodox Church. And so it's what we might call proto-Russian. 
and it contains more stories about Enoch and about Melchizedek, whom we're not going to deal with. And then third Enoch is a written or compiled sometime between the second and fifth centuries AD, but in Hebrew. Again, more stories about Enoch and how he became an angel named Metatron. So, we're going to deal only with first Enoch. So, what about the first Enoch? Well, interestingly, we only had it in Ethiopia for, for centuries. So Greek portions were found. But then with the Dead Sea Scrolls in cave number four, named after Qumran, so 4Q201 and others, actually preserve fragments of the Book of Enoch, which was already being read by Jewish communities in the second century before Jesus and following. So this, this was important literature at the time. So, and so virtually every Jewish community read this book, or they listened to it. And we also are going to discover that the New Testament writers read the book of Enoch. We know they did because they quote from it. We shall give an example of that. Okay, so a few facts. As we said earlier, written probably the third century before Christ, in Aramaic, which is a Semitic language similar to Hebrew. Uh, I've studied three Semitic languages <laughs> and speak a partly, speak a fourth language which has many Semitic grammatical features to it. I can decipher Arabic, but not enough to mention. All right, second temple period literature. There's a phrase we want you to learn and remember. The second temple period. What are we referring to? <laughs> Remember Solomon who built a temple for Yahweh? Well, what happened to it? Yeah, met, met Babylon. The Babylonians tore it down. Kind of, kind of had a misfortune. They did. <laughs> and after uh, about 70 years, when the Jewish people were allowed to come back to their own land, the emperor, the Babylonian king, said, go back and build the temple and pray for me. Because he, he wanted all of the gods, even the Hebrew god, to pray for him. And so we call, we call that then, up until the destruction of Jerusalem, the second temple period. What was it normally called by Christians? We had a intertestamental period between the two testaments. As we mentioned, fragments have been found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, and those fragments were copied in the second century BC, according to the people who study those things. First Enoch, chapters 6 through 16, recount the sin that was committed by the watchers. watchers which lies behind the New Testament. I want you to read chapters 1 through 16, which won't take you long, because you get, you, you get the whole story that's the background of the New Testament. Not the theology of the New Testament, but the background. All right, speaking of watchers and Nephilim, what do you see in the picture? The satellite. So there is a lot of speculation out there in the world, on the internet, about who drives flying saucers. Who are the creatures in the UFOs? And one of the hypotheses or theories is that those are the Nephilim who survived the flood or who were born after the flood. And they're very clever, just as they were before the flood, and they have very fast uh, sneaking machines to travel around in. Uh, so if they ever invite you for a ride, kiddies, don't go. Uh, I was actually reared in a pagan family that believed in flying saucers. Crazy stuff. All right, so then, who are the watchers? Well, any guesses? They are mentioned in, by name in Daniel chapter 4, both the singular and the plural. 
This particular section of the book of Daniel is only preserved in Aramaic. Most of the Old Testament is Hebrew, except for certain portions. And in the first century, if you were Jewish, you already read Aramaic, whether you learned Hebrew or not. All right, in Daniel 4, 17, they are called the watchers, the holy ones. That's interesting. So are the watchers evil demons, or are they good angels? Or what's the other logical possibility? A combination of the two. They're, God, they're good ones and bad ones. <laughs> One of the questions is, why call them watchers? Anyway, the, the NIV said Christians don't know the word watchers. That, that's going to spook them out. So let's translate it with something more familiar, like messengers. Problem is, they weren't messengers. Well, isn't there already a messenger equivalent? Yeah, all right. The word angel is messenger. A, we brought the Greek word angel into our language and to designate a certain class of beings, but the Greek readers themselves just saw them as messengers from God. So not all spirit beings are messengers. Only those that carry messages are angels. And there are other kinds. Did to wear the little hat in the Western Union best as well? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, in the book of Daniel, the watchers are good creatures. We'll call them angels here for convenience. No, they weren't. They are members of God's entourage. Or, as many say, members of the divine council. Because you get pictures in different parts of the Bible, God meeting with groups of spirit beings. Can you think of some examples? Where did that happen? Psalm 82. Job. Psalm 82, Job chapters 1 and 2. Um, my, and the story of the, uh, the prophet Micah who told the story of Yahweh meeting with the angels to plan the death of Ahab. <laughs> and there are other such uh, passages in the Bible. In reading this book, we shall encounter those. So, but in the book of Enoch, though we only deal with the watchers who sinned. And so we'll call them bad angels. And these are, we find them in the epistles of Jude and Peter. If you're interested, the Aramaic term is or in the plural, chirim. Uh, the term actually was used in ancient languages to mean the protectors of a city. So they're not watchers in the sense that they're just looking, Woo! but they were protectors of human cities in their first assignment. Yeah. Would, would this be like the resistance that the archangel ran into when he was trying to come to Daniel? <clears throat> okay. He had right. to subdue a, a guardian of Babylon first? Uh, that, okay, that's an interesting text. They don't use the term ear, they use the word seer with a Emphatic S. I'll take Seer, it which we translate prince. Yes. The prince of Persia. The prince of Persia. The prince of Greece. Yes. The prince of Israel. And so the, the, these are all part of the divine council assigned, given assignments over humanity from God. And they're still there, but many of them do a bad job as described in Psalm 82. All right, what did Jude actually say? Let's look at this. Here's what Jude said about the watchers. Would someone like to read that? See, the Lord is coming <coughs> with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all the deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Speaking of speaking against them, I misspoke. This is not about the watchers. This is how Jude quotes from the book of Enoch. Here's what the book of Enoch says. Read that one too. Look, 
He comes with the myriads of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to destroy all the wicked and to convict all humanity for all the wicked deeds that they have done and the proud and hard words that wicked sinners spoke against him. Okay, two different translators, so they sound a little different. Let's look at it in Greek. Here's what it looks like in modern Greek characters. Sorry, it's me. Ooh. And here's what it looks like in the book of Jude as preserved in Greek. Uh, the first part of it looks different, but it's the same Greek words, different conjugation. And the first one says, Behold, the Lord comes. In the second line it says, He is coming. So it's spelled differently. Now, Greek is a highly conjugated language. Words, every verb has more than 300 forms, potentially. But the last half of it, you notice it's identical, word for word for word. So, and so we think Jude either had a copy of Enoch in front of him, or he knew it well enough that he could pretty well paraphrase part of it and quote the rest. Let's look now at Genesis uh, chapter 6, the first two verses. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they choose. Yes, and they did. Now, where did the book of Genesis get this idea? Well, if you're an atheist, you would say they copied it from the Mesopotamians. If you're a historian, you would say, well, the Mesopotamians, the Hebrews, they all knew the same stories. <laughs> they weren't necessarily copying from anybody. So, first of all, the phrase, the sons of God, the word God is plural in the Hebrew, and so you could legitimately translate the sons of the gods, me or the word son only means a boy if it's used in contrast with girls. <laughs> Otherwise, it means children. Boys offspring, oh. children. In this case, uh, it's used metaphorically of spirit beings created by God, whom he had put in charge of different regions of the world. Hey, Galen? Yes. Could it not have anything to do with the sons of God being Adam's sons? And I mean... We are next... We, we are going to look at that theory. Wait. And there are several theories. Okay. Yeah, that one was made up about 150 years ago. It's not very old. Okay. Okay. Or became popular, I should say. You mainly to teach talk, farm boys to be careful of those city girls. You, you're talking about the the descent of Seth versus the descent of Cain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Enoch watchers, as the way where they're presented and described in the Book of Enoch, are these sons of God. But since he was writing in Aramaic. He didn't use the Hebrew phrase. He used the more popular Aramaic term that was also used by the pagans to talk about those same creatures, whatever they were. All right, let's talk about Mesopotamia for a moment. Note there are the, uh, the two rivers. <clears throat> so these ancient empires, Assyria, Babylonia, and Sumer, and these ancient cities, Nineveh, Assur, etc., Uruk, by the way, is now, is today called Iraq. So, in Ur, where Abraham was from, there's all of that region. So all of those old biblical guys, they grew up with this kind of mythology. This story of the sons of God and their daughters of men was important during the Second Temple period. All the Jews knew it, they all told the story. All right, and the other nations had their own versions of the same divine rebellion. They all saw it as an angelic or spirit rebellion against the Creator God. Now, if you go to a secular university and your professor is kind of elderly and hasn't read a cracked a book open in decades, because he gives the same lecture every term, <laughs> he will tell your, ch your grandchildren, the Hebrews were stupid. They were 
Bedouins, they didn't know how to read or write, so they couldn't make up their own stories. So they borrowed all of their stories from the more intelligent, literate pagans. And Noah, they will tell you, wasn't had a, he had an earlier name. His name was, what do the atheists say? Gilgamesh. Yeah. You've heard that name. Anyway, New Testament writers allude to the divine rebellion, citing the book of Enoch. We saw an example earlier. Now, what is the Bible doing? If the Bible is using the prevalent stories of creator gods and angels and spirit beings and, and city guards and a great rebellion against the creator which brought all kinds of disaster to the human race, just what is going on between the Bible and the other mythologies? The Bible is a polemic. You know the word? It comes from a Latin term that means war. Having war once against one against another. The Bible is written in a way to correct the pagan mythology by reminding everybody it was not the sun or the moon that created the world. It was it was Yahweh. It was the God of the Bible. And then it demonstrates why that is true. Well, all those mythologies were forgotten until they were digged up again in the cuneiform tablets in the, over the last century and a half. And then we forgot the old context and made up our own mythologies. Right, so what's going on here? What do you see is happening? Discipleship. Could be, yeah, some kind of discipleship. Anyway, you see a contrast between the two individuals. Age. Age. <laughs> so which one thinks he knows the Bible better? <laughs> okay, so this is the old pastor. He's giving counsel to the young man, and he's telling, and he's looking at Genesis chapter 6, and he's warning the young man, stay away from those girls. Because here's what will happen. It led to the flood. What would happen to you? Well, he's right about the morality. He was just wrong about the story. All right, some implications of this, in my mind. You don't have to agree. First, the Watcher's story was already current. All right, so the story was already current during biblical times. And the Genesis 6 account relates to that story in its original context, meaning Mesopotamia because Israel, for most of its history, was a client state, a vassal state, to Mesopotamian empires, the Assyrians and the Babylonians uh, in particular, and the Egyptians, most of its history. All right, the Sons of Seth theory is rather recent. No ancient Israelites ever believed that the sons of God were the lineage of Seth. They did believe that they were angels of some kind. So, what are we going to do with the Seth theory? It has nothing to do with the original context. Therefore, it was made up by well-meaning pastors for pastoral reasons, and it largely has to do with what we call it a Western bias against anything supernatural. So, if you ask any evangelicals, who, who are the kinds of spirit beings that are in the Bible? Who are they? Who are the spirits in the Bible? Number one? Angels and demons. Angels and demons. The Holy Spirit? Yes. <laughs> well, at least God and Jesus, who's somehow half divine. Whereas in the Hebrew Bible, there are about 24 different terms for different kinds of spirit beings. And there's only one kind that has wings. None of the other angels that appear any place in the Bible has wings. So winged angels are only found at the top of Christmas trees. <laughs> we in the West, we are naturally anti-supernatural in our reaction against the religions and the churches that he grew up under. So what would be the six-winged figure of 
the chariot divisions of the prophets. They're all they're called cherubs. Cherubs. Yeah, and cherubs are known cherub throughout the Mesopotamian region as being throne guardians. Okay. And they are said to be winged, to be winged, at least in the and you can go look up under Google Images, just type in winged angels, and it will it will bring up epigraphical and carvings from all over Mesopotamia showing cherubs with wings. And the Hebrew Bible borrows that method, that vocabulary, and that's that's where the winged idea came from. Aren't they, aren't they over the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant? Yes, but those are statues. Yeah, with wings, because they are guarding God's throne over the Ark of the Covenant. Like then the Watcher's story partly explains the sinful human condition. All right, let me ask you, you're evangelical Christians. You know the Bible. You've been well taught. You've heard a thousand sermons or more. How do we explain the human condition? that we are so sin-prone and violent and warlike and selfish. What happened? What happened to our race? We were cursed from the fall. We were cursed from the fall. Yes, exactly. It's the results of the, the fall. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Paul kind of agreed with that. Yeah, he did. Paul also agreed with the other explanations. So, what happened before Adam and Eve's sin that had disastrous results for the human race? Third of the angels under Lucifer. Well, the fall from heaven. The fall of the devil, Satan. Uh, in the Genesis, they use a got it Mesopotamian title for the big demon, the chief demon. They called him the in Hebrew the Nakash. Nakash comes from a root that means shiny. There's another word for serpent in Hebrew, but they sometimes use the term shiny for serpents that had shiny skin. And somehow our Bible translators decided to call him uh, a serpent. And so an atheist will tell you, oh, you believe in the sky fairy and talking snakes, right? Well, they're stupid. They don't know the Bible any better than we do. And the Nakash was historically called the, the shiny one, the serpent one, if you wish, who first, he was the first one to sin by saying, I will go to the top of God's mountain, and I will sit there, and I will be like the Most High. But he then decided, I need these humans whom God has put in charge of the earth, I'm going to have to suborn them so I can remain chief of the earth. And so he lied. We believed it. All right. But then there was a third event in the Bible that has even more disastrous consequences for the human race. What am I talking about? The Watchers. The Watchers who taught us warfare and immorality and uh, drug usage and more. Let's, uh, here is a, uh, a quotation from the book of Enoch, chapter 6. Not scripture, but we can read it aloud if someone would like to. I will. All right. Then they all swore together <clears throat> and bound one another with a curse, mm -hmm. and they were all, all of them, 200 who descended in the days of Jared onto the peak of Mount Hermon. And they called the mountain Hermon because they swore and bound one another with a curse on it. Yes. All right. Who are we talking about here? Well, the previous verse said is the watchers. Uh, according to this text, there were 200 of them that rebelled. So the account says they came down on Mount Hermon. Now, interestingly, this is from a Semitic root, Kharem. And in the language we spoke, whenever we wanted to say that something was cursed or forbidden or we don't want it to happen, we would just simply say Haram. Mount Hermon is the Mount of Cursing. And in the sense that if we don't 
agree with you. We don't go down there and take wives along with you, sir. May we be cursed. By Yahweh. Apparently, Jared was the father of Enoch. Okay, yes. thank you. According to Genesis 5.18 in genealogy. I'm not going to argue against that. No, no, I, I just, I, 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 What's happening in the story, or in the, in the picture? In the context of this lesson, and according to the author who drew this, we have here a watcher in human form who is showing magic to whom? A daughter, a beautiful daughter of Adam. And she, does she look like she's interested? Uh -huh. Oh, wow. A quick overview now of where we're going with this. First, the watchers infected the human race. More detail. They taught war, seduction, and the use of all kinds of trees and roots and clippings to make medic medicines and drugs. The, the poor ladies, they get blamed for so much in the Bible. But what did God do to those 200? Remember what uh, Peter says? They, God damned them. They are held under bondage in a dark place underneath the earth, waiting the judgment. And more detail about that in the book of Enoch. Then the Nephilim, remember that with the women, they bore children. But what happened to those children in the flood? They all drowned. They died. What happened to their souls? According to the book of Enoch, the souls did not descend to the underworld. They remained in the world as the demon spirits that are still troubling humanity to this day. They used to be half God, half human. Does that sound bizarre? Yes. It sounds very great. It sounds logical. Okay. So then, Jesus came to restore Eden, that is the original state of the earth, on earth by redeeming humankind from its sin and from under demonic authority, thereby reversing Hermon, bringing Mount Hermon and the spirits upon it back under the rule of Yahweh through the Lord Jesus Christ. But everyone's asking, is the book of Enoch scripture? To answer this, we have to be familiar with a couple of words. One word is canon, one N. This is not a big gun. A canon is a collection of writings that any group, in this case the church, accepts as authoritative. We believe that writing. Here some examples of canonic writings. The Gospels. The Gospels, the Epistles, yeah. the Book of Revelation. Those 66. Right, so For that's the Christian collection. church of today. And at different points in Christian history, the canon had other books in it, which were later removed because of the second concept here, inspired. Right? An inspired book, then, is one that is accurate and free of error because the Holy Spirit guided its authors. Now, this is a biblical concept, very important in Christian theology. Some books are inspired. Other religious books might be helpful and useful, but they're not inspired. They're not uh, free of error. So, when we can take inspired books and put those in our canon, those books we will call scripture. Scripture. Scripture is a canon of inspired writings. And so, here's my contention. The book of Enoch is neither canonical, nor is it inspired. But it is concerned, concerned we do consider it worthy to be read because why? Why should we bother reading it? Context. Yes. Scriptural context. Historical Scriptural context. context, and because the Bible writers, New Testament writers, they read it, and they used its language, and many of its concepts. Well, there's an exception to what I just said, and that is the church in Ethiopia. I worked four years in Ethiopia, and I was amazed to find an ancient Christian church in Africa that has been literate for millennia, whereas most of the tribes did not need writing because they were so clever that they could remember everything. Not a question of intelligence, but rather of 
culture. The church in Ethiopia believes that the book of Enoch is both cano is canonical scripture and they have preserved it in their ancient language called Ge'ez uh, down to this day. And the translations that we now have are made from Ethiopia compared with Greek copies that were made uh, late, even later. Oh. Have you seen these pictures on the, on the internet? Oh, is this to prove that there were giants? Lots of photographs of very big skeletons. What's the problem, though, with this kind of a photograph? Too easy to Photoshop. <laughs> Photoshop it, but more recently, just go open any AI engine and say, draw me a picture of an anthropologist examining a big skull. And it will draw that big. That's what they did here. All right, the main characters, then, of this story are the sons of God, members of God's first entourage, his divine counsel, the watchers, just the Aramaic term for the same thing. Nephilim are the giant offspring of the sons of God, uh, when the sons of God mated with human women. And we're going to find that they uh, learn more about the Apkalu in chapter 3, who are the Mesopotamian counterparts of the same guys. And in that context, we will learn a little bit about Noah, who is fully human. Whereas the Mesopotamian story of Gilgamesh, he is only part human and two-thirds divine. So he, the Hebrews made a mistake if they really copied from Gilgamesh. Okay, um, we'll end here with my hypothesis. I'm going to suggest that God created, in the beginning, corporal, earthly, reproducing creatures, some of whom are called watchers. Now, the books say they came down, Enoch says they came down from heaven, but in the Hebrew concept of heaven, where does heaven start? Or, if you want to translate, where does the sky start? Is it up there in the blue? Or well, the Hebrew Bible, Heaven starts at Earth, the, the, the surface of the Earth, and goes up. And anything that dwelt on Earth but had access to God was said to be a an heavenly being. And therefore, these were reproducing creatures in Eden. Then God created the plants, reproducing through seed, the beasts in the usual way. And then finally, the human beings, beginning with Adam and Eve. I might be wrong, but we'll test this hypothesis <clears throat> against the, uh, uh, the material as we learn it. Therefore, both watchers and humans have had bodies, mind and spirit, and the watchers were able to mate with human beings, though it was forbidden. Okay. Any question before we break up? Yes. I'm going to offer a solo best because that's a lot of information. It's, okay, it's, it's on that website. Were you here when I demonstrated that? Yeah. You can go there, download the document, and get all of this stuff. Plus more. Where do angels come into play that we think of angels? Um, they're not watchers, or they are watchers? Uh, well, there probably are still some good watchers here. But. Um, it, well, like Gabriel and okay. Michael and that kind of thing. Online, there's a, go to the site, there's a link to our course on titled The Supernatural Realm, in which you deal with all the kinds of angels.